In the last lesson, or last week rather, we focused on something that's very important. We focused on how we go about seeking the truth in our lives. And one of the things we learned very clearly was that there are a lot of traps, there's a lot of pitfalls on the way, spiritual traps that will keep us from the truth if we let them. But we also learned that according to those main categories of issues, there are ways around them. The first of which is humility. We need to be humble enough to recognize we don't have all the answers, to recognize the truth when we see it, even if it's not what we already thought. In other words, we have to be humble enough to recognize that if we have previously conceived ideas about God's Word, when it says something different, we need to accept that as His Word and not try to do what we want to do instead. The second step was to make sure we follow His path exactly. His path being, of course, His Word, the Gospel. If we don't follow His path exactly, then we're not going to be able to do the things we should be doing all along. And that's the point. He tells us what He wants and what He doesn't want. He doesn't leave it up to chance or leave it up to us to decide. We have to follow his word. And the third step was occasionally we're going to come across an item where there is no answer, no final answer in this life. We don't understand the exact length of eternity and we never will in this life. We don't understand the nature of God and we won't in this life. These things are beyond mortal minds and when it says something in them and the word about that and it's beyond our ability to study it, or at least we study to a point and we can't get any farther, then we need to accept what His Word says because He's proven Himself right and so much else that we can trust Him on a few things. Now, I think we did a very good job in that lesson. Uh, I think we did a very good job of dealing with what especially humility is and what trust is, the steps one and three. But the second step in the middle is itself worthy of several lessons, and so we only briefly summarized it. Today and tonight's lesson also are going to be where we focus on how do we determine what God wants from us in His Word. How do we understand His Word? Because really in life, how do we understand what's right and what's wrong? How do we really get what's true and what's false? Well, the easy answer is what we said last week, that you examine the evidence and reason from it to the only possible conclusion. However, that still doesn't help us if we don't know what the standard is. Let's say something. This applies to everything. This is not just religion. This applies to legal matters. You always hear lawyers on TV arguing saying there's a precedent for this decision or that decision. That means there's a standard that's already been set. Then we hear about it in, in even scientific things like units of distance and time, weights and measures, money and value. Everything has to have a standard by which it is measured. Otherwise, there would be no way of telling one thing from another. I'll give you an example. If I were to say to you, my house, our new house here, is a drive of 13 chronos away from here, and I didn't tell you what a chronos was, you'd have no idea what I was talking about. I could be talking about distance, either miles or feet or whatever. I could be talking about time, you know, minutes or hours or whatever. You wouldn't have any idea unless I explain that word. If I pick this up and I say, and again, I'm picking actual ancient Greek words, so if you know it, you know, it's not the point. If I pick this up and I say logos, if you don't know what that word meant, you're not going to know. Do I mean book? Do I mean this particular book, the Bible? Do I mean the color black because this outside of the cover of the Bible is black? Do I mean just writing because there's writing on the inside? If I don't explain, if there's no standard by which to compare these words, it's not going to become clear what I'm talking about. In other words, we have to know what the standard is before we can come to any kind of conclusion. Thankfully, God gave us the standard. We don't have to come up with one on our own. As it says in 2 Peter 1 and verse 3, God's word has given us, His power has given us His word that deals with everything with life and godliness. Everything we need for life and religion, as we read last week, He has given us in this His word. As Paul said in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, hopefully one we all have memorized or will soon, he said all scripture, that's every word in this book, all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. That literally means breathed out or spoken by God. Every word is God's own words. And it's profitable for us. For doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness. So that the person of God may be complete and thoroughly equipped for every good work. The word complete means mature. This is how we grow as Christians from being new Christians to being mature and stable Christians. 
Or, in other words, it's God's power for us. These are not just bare words on a page. This is not a piece of literature like Shakespeare. It's better as a piece of literature than even Shakespeare, but it's not just a piece of literature. As it says in Romans 1.16, the gospel is of Christ is the power of God for our salvation to everyone who believes it. And in verse 17, he tells us how. For in it, God's righteousness is revealed. His righteous plan for us is revealed from faith into faith. For as it is written, the just must live by faith. How could we live by a standard of faith we didn't even know? And so he gave it to us in the gospel. One more for now. Jesus came right out and said it in John 12, 48, when he said very clearly, those who reject him do not receive his words. It's the same thing. People say, give me Christ but not his church, give me Jesus but not the, the religion. Well, the religion is recorded in here. You cannot accept Jesus and not his word. He says, he who rejects me, rejects me rejects my word, and he already has that which judges him. He already has the standard. What is the standard? He said, the word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. And we could go on and spend an entire lesson proving that the Bible is God's word, but that's something for another time. It is already, if we're especially, hopefully, if we're all Christians here today, and I hope we all are, that we understand that and we accept it, that this is his word. So how do we understand it? People always claim the Bible's hard to understand. It's so difficult to get through the things in this book. How can we understand it? Well, that's what we're going to do today in lesson one and two, morning and evening. We're going, or if this is on the radio later, as I think it will be one week from the next, this will be the two-part lesson on how do we find from God's Word what He wants us to do and what He wants us not to do. How do we determine His authority on required religious matters? Well, the first thing we have to do is make sure we're not distracted. This is where it continues in with the humility aspect. We don't want those preconceived ideas put on blinders. You know, they put blinders on horses, when, like the Amish buggies and stuff, because the cars will scare them if they don't have the blinders on. It keeps them going straight forward. Do we have blinders on that keeps us from seeing parts of God's will for us? Sometimes we do. Maybe our vision is clouded by man-made doctrine. So the first thing is to make sure we don't. And we're just going to list a few possible things, because there's nearly endless false doctrines out there. But some of the false standards of authority that this world accepts and that major religions even preach as being authoritative are, some, are false, and these are some of them. First of all, man-made religious traditions. We talked about it briefly last week. Eventually, every false religion came from some man saying, I don't like what God wants me to do. I'm going to do it my way and not his way. Every single one of the false religions out there, if you go back far enough, started that way. And so, Jesus condemns it. Mark 7, verses 6 through 9, he condemns it very strongly. He says to the people there, Well, did Isaiah prophesy about you hypocrites, saying, This people honor me with their lips. They claim to serve me, in other words, but their hearts are far from me. And in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrine the commandments of men. Why was it useless for them to worship him or serve him the way they were doing? Because he says in verse 8, For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold to your own traditions. And he says it again in verse 9, All too well you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your traditions. In other words, and this is not very popular, especially among the denominations out there today, any man-made tradition keeps us from obeying God's word. If we have anything in our religious belief and practices that did not come directly from the Bible, it came from some other man some other time, we're already not serving him. We're serving something else. Maybe ourselves, maybe a certain particular person, but we're not serving him. Another false standard of authority is what I call the family tie theology. And we've all heard this is not just religion. We hear this about sports teams. We hear this about political parties and about religion. If it was good enough for my parents or my grandparents or my ancestors, then it's good enough for me. Well, Jesus said that's not the case. He said very clearly in Matthew 10, 37, he did not say you can't love your family. He said, you can't choose them over me. He said, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. We can't use our families as an excuse not to serve him. And if we really thought about it, that is probably one of the most ridiculous arguments we'll ever have heard. Because if you, if you really think about it, Christianity started long time after all the families in the world pretty much started. Everyone who was a Christian was converted into it. No one was born 
physically as a Christian. No one ever has been. We have to be converted. We have to obey the gospel and understand it and obey it. In fact, if we go back far enough, if this were really true, then none of us would be Christians. Depending on, I don't know, everyone's family descent yet, we'd all either be Jews or idol-worshipping pagans if we go back far enough. We wouldn't be Christians at all. So we can't use families as an excuse. Each of us is responsible for our own relationship with God. Another false standard of authority is the, what I call majority theology. A lot of people don't like to put a lot of effort into things. They just want to follow the crowd and do what... And so they'll say, if the majority of religious scholars claim something is true, then we'll do it. But if you study the Bible enough, you come to realize the majority has always been wrong. There's never been a time except for, you know, right after the flood or right in the Garden of Eden before they fell. There's never been another time where the majority of people on this planet have been right with God. That's why the Bible repeatedly talks about remnants being the only ones faithful. The one that pops to my mind is Elijah. Because he was, compl- he was a great prophet, but at one point he got depressed. He complained to God, I'm the only one who's still serving you. And God said, no. I have reserved for myself a remnant of 7,000 people in the kingdom of Israel. There may have been hundreds of thousands, for all we know, maybe millions. We don't have the exact census anymore from those days. But there were hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of people, and God preserved 7,000 because they were faithful to him. It's a small number, a small percentage. Like at the time of the ark, only eight people in the whole world were faithful, and so only eight people were saved from the flood. You can't trust the majority. And Jesus even warns us of that. In Matthew 7, 13 and 14, he commanded his disciples, enter in by the difficult gate, the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and easy is the way that leads to destruction. But narrow is the gate and difficult is the way that leads into life. And there are only few who find it. He said of the wide gate back in verse 13, there are many will go in by it. He said in verse 14, only few will go in by the difficult way, but it's the only one, he said, that goes to life. And so we need to make sure we're not trying to follow the crowd, that we are making sure we're on God's side, because honestly, God is the majority. If six billion or whatever now is the population of the world disagree with us, and only God and his word agree with our doctrine, then we're still in the majority, even though they don't see it. Because God is the majority. Some people like to rely on man-made wisdom. And this is not the same thing as I mean before with long-term religious traditions. I mean, they'll turn to the wise men that they respect. Maybe if they're worldly, they turn to philosophers and scientists. Maybe if they're somewhat religious, they turn to their preachers and say, whatever you say, because you are the expert, I will trust. A lot of people turn to the worldly experts because they don't understand that God's word is not easy. And they say, well, because it doesn't make sense to me on a physical level, then I'll just trust the physical scientists and philosophers. We have to remember God's ways are higher than that. Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9, the Lord said to the prophet, My thoughts are above, are not your thoughts, and my ways are not your ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. If we don't exactly follow his word, we're never going to understand it. Even if we turn to the so-called wise religious people and religious leaders of the day and we farm out our responsibilities and say, you go and study, you figure out the answer, and when you figure it out, you come back and tell us. It doesn't work that way. Matthew 15, 13, and 14, that's what the Jews did with the Pharisees and with the Sadducees and the other groups. didn't work out too well for them either. About the false teachers of his day, Jesus said in Matthew 15, 13, uh, really all false teaching, he said, Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. It will be removed and cast out. And so for now, he said to them, leave them alone. They are blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind leads the blind, both will fall into the ditch. How do you make sure your personal expert is not himself been blinded by something? Well, you've got to be like the Bereans in Acts 17.11. You've got to look for yourself. Remember, it said there they were more noble than the ones in Thessalonica. How were they more noble? Because just like the ones in Thessalonica, they received the word with all readiness, but they did not just accept their word for it. They then did what? They went and searched the scriptures daily to see whether the things they were taught were so. Don't ever just take my word for anything. Look it up in his word. Because I might make a mistake. I might be wrong about something. and I don't know anything right now I am. Because if I knew, I'd change it. But I could be. And so make sure you check everything. 
with actually what the Bible says. In fact, that's what we're doing this today for. There's an old saying about how if you teach a man to fish, he'll eat for a day. If you teach, if you, well, I said it wrong. Give a man a fish, he'll eat for a day. Teach a man to fish, he'll eat for a lifetime. This is a lot more important than fish. This is the bread of life right here. I don't just want to say to you, this is what the Bible says. I want to say to you, this is how we can all learn to study and understand what the Bible says. If I just spill out a few aphorisms and a few sayings once or twice a week, then it will eventually start doing some good. But if I teach you how to study on your own, and everyone studies on their own like the Bereans, it will be a lot better. We'll grow a lot faster. And we'll do a lot more for the Lord in our lives. One last false standard of authority, what I call the Jiminy Cricket theology. Depending on the way they word it, letting your heart be your guide, your feelings be your guide, or your conscience be your guide. This sounds nice in a Disney movie, but what does the Bible say? The Lord actually says you can't trust your feelings. You can't trust your heart in religion. If you do, you will go wrong. Proverbs 14.12, the Lord inspired Solomon to say this, There is a way that seems right to a man, but the end of it is death. Proverbs 28, 26, a few chapters after, he said, He who trusts in his own heart is a fool, but whoever walks or conducts himself wisely will be saved. And so trusting in your heart makes you a fool. Trusting in the Lord's walking of wisely makes you saved. This is showing a pattern here. It wasn't just Solomon. Jeremiah, the prophet of sorrows, as he's commonly called, said the same thing. In Jeremiah 10, 23, he said, O Lord, I know the way of man is not within himself. It is not in man who walks to be able to direct his own steps. And of course in the context it's because those who do go astray and they don't do right. Or in probably one of the most powerful statements about this, Jeremiah 17 and verse 9, The heart is deceitful above all things, the Lord said through the prophet. The heart is deceitful above all things and it is desperately wicked. Who could understand it? You know, in listening to religious radio in the morning on Sundays sometimes, it amazes me how many people say, just trust your feelings, and they'll make sure that they take you to God. But God said, don't trust your feelings, because they'll lead you away from me. Trust what? Trust my truth, my word. John eight thirty two. Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and then what? Then is when the truth shall make you free or save you. If we don't know the truth first, if we just feel it, then it's not going to help. We're going to go wrong. Now, there's a lot of other possible ways of looking at false authority. There's a lot of other theories out there that are false. There's only one that's right. And again, that is God's Word, doing it His way, the way He has written it. And you know, once we get rid of all these blinders and all these distractions, that claim that the Bible's really hard to understand... It goes away because the fact is the Bible actually teaches us how to interpret it itself. If we look at it, if we just read the way that Jesus and his apostles interpreted the Old Testament and taught it to the people in the New Testament, then we're going to see how we can interpret the New Testament and apply it to our lives today. And so there are three main ways the Bible authorizes us to do or not to do things. The first one is one we probably hear all the time, the word command. Now, commands describe things that can or cannot be done, the most famous of which are the Ten Commandments, full of thou shalts and thou shalt nots. Very clear statements. They're hard to debate and argue because they're so clear. However, some things that are stated clearly and are required are not in the command structure of a sentence. For example, John 1 and verse 1 tells us that Jesus was God just like the Father. It says there, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, there's plenty of other passages that say you must believe that Jesus is the Son of God. So we're clear on that. But this one is not formed as a command. It's formed simply as a, excuse me, a statement of fact. Any statement of fact in the Scripture is a required belief or a required practice. Any direct statement whatsoever of the Lord's Word is binding upon us. And they come in two basic kinds. There is the positive commands or, or statements. There's the negative statements. And what I mean by that is, for example, in Mark 16 and verse 16, right after he said to teach people the gospel, he said about their response, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not will be condemned. It's fairly simple. He positively commands us to believe and be baptized to receive a blessing. He says, here's an action I want you to do, and if you do it, you'll be blessed. 
The negative commands are prohibitive in nature. They tell us what not to do. For example, 1 Peter 2 and verse 11, Peter said, Beloved, I beg you as travelers and pilgrims to abstain from the fleshly lusts which war against the soul. The word abstain is in the command structure there in the Greek. It literally is saying you must keep away from these things, these fleshly temptations that war against our souls. And so we have an example of a positive command and a negative command. They're both positive in the fact that they'll help us be saved, but one is to do, one is to not do. And we could go on, we could list hundreds, literally, of positive and negative commands both, but since these are so clear, we're not going to take any more time. The bottom line is that the Bible ever directly states anything, we need to be able to accept it. Otherwise, we have no trust in God. If it states it, it is true. But this is not the only way the Bible authorizes us. There are direct statements, but there is also what we call indirect statements. These things are referred to most often as necessary inferences. They are also called implicit statements or uh, direct implications or forced conclusions. Now, these are things which are stated, but they're not stated word for word. For example, there's a particular passage in, Ma in Matthew where it says that Jesus came down from the mountain. If you look, and you can look every previous word of Matthew up to that point, it never says he went up into that mountain. Because the author knows that it's just simple common sense that if he went up in the mountain, he had to, if he came down on the mountain, he had, had to previously gone up. Why waste the time describing the fact that he went up? That's the point. There are some things that are so, that's a, that's a small example, but there are some things that are so absolutely clear that the only possible answer is the truth. Now, we have to get technical for a minute. I don't like to get too technical, but we have to. This most, the re reason most people call this necessary inference is because the difference in, in technically between implication and inference. To imply something is the author's job. To infer something is the reader's job. Any conclusion we draw, right or not, is an inference. Any imp implication he made was his and not ours. However, if, and I'm going to be clear here, we don't want to get too strict on that, because if we do infer correctly, if we look at the evidence and reason and reach the right conclusion, that is also what his direct implication was to begin with. And of course, if it's the only possible answer, and the Bible being perfect and without contradiction or error, can only have one possible answer to every question, then when we find the one answer that's absolutely true, it is therefore the forced conclusion. Now, people claim this does you could, they'll say, oh, okay, you can have an implication, but you can't bind it as religious requirement. But the Lord did. Turn with me to Matthew 22. In debating with the Sadducees who claimed that there was no resurrection, uh, he taught them that there was a resurrection, but he did it by implication, because they were technically right. The Sadducees believed only that the five books of Moses were the only true scriptures of God's word. They didn't accept any of the prophecies or anything else that came after that. And they were technically right in that the book of Moses, never, none of them ever used the word resurrection. That's true doesn't mean they didn't teach on the resurrection. It means they didn't directly say there was going to be a resurrection. And that's what Jesus teaches them here by implication. He says, starting in verse 29, that you are mistaken. Why? Because you know not the scriptures themselves, nor the power of God. Now, they could quote, most of them, the main Sadducees could quote all five books of Moses. How could he say they didn't know the scriptures? Because you can say the words and not understand them. That's what the whole purpose of this lesson is, to learn to understand things. And so he says to them in verse uh, 31, concerning the resurrection, have you not read what was spoken to you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now notice the present tense verse there. This was quoted from, or quoted from the time when he spoke to Moses. Moses lived hundreds of years after Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob died. So how could he use the present tense? Well, Jesus explains in the rest of verse 32, God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Now, obviously, he didn't mean physically dead, because they were physically dead. But the Pharisees believed that once you died, that was it. You ceased to exist. There was no soul. He's saying God could not have said, present tense, I'm still the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, hundreds of years after they died, if there was no soul to resurrect later. That was his point. He taught them with a positive implication of God's own Old Testament scriptures. He said, this is a required belief. 
that you believe that there will be a resurrection. Even though the word resurrection was never said in Deuteronomy that he quoted from. You see how it works there. It must have been the case if he could say that present tense. They also prohibit. People say, well, you can't prohibit with implications, but they do. Hebrews 7, verses 12 through 14. And the context, and sometime read all of Hebrews, especially chapters 6 through 10 for the focus on this. His focus in chapter 6 through 10 is on Christ and how he is now the high priest, how the old law is done away with, how the new law is now in effect, and why this all happened and how it all happened. For our purpose today, he's just going to focus on the priesthood of Christ. Hebrews seven twelve through 14 For the priesthood being changed, of necessity there was also a change of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe, from which no man has officiated at the altar. For it is evident, literally it is obvious, that the Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning the priesthood. Now notice how he worded that there. He did not say God commanded that no one from Judah shall ever serve as a priest. And if you go back and you read it, he never said that. All God has to do is say, this is what I want. And all the other options are automatically excluded. This is what people mean when they say the silence of the scripture forbids. If God said Levi, he didn't have to list out Dan, Asher, Judah, and so on. All he had to do was say, I want Levi to be priest. And all the rest of them were automatically not able to be priests. And so when we find a silence of the scripture issue, where he said, do it this way, then we can't do it any other way. So clearly, the implications of the scriptures are binding, both positively and negatively. Basically, if the Lord and his inspired writers could do this, so can we, if we reason from their writings properly, all of these inferences will be his will for our lives, his doctrinal commandments for us. There's one more way in which the scriptures authorize, and that is by example. Sometimes they are called approved example. Sometimes they're called accounts of action. Sometimes they're called inspired accounts of action. But ultimately what an example is, is someone showing us how to obey God. And a lot of times they're doubled up. You'll have a command in one place. In another place, you'll have a person doing it. And so we have both the command and the action. We have the statement from God, do this, and someone else showing us how to do it properly. But I'll give you an example here. Uh, the procedure of the Lord's Supper is one of them. We'll come to that in a minute. The procedure of, for example, appointing elders is one of them. We'll come to that in a minute. How does the example make it binding, though? That's the real question. Well, the scriptures say that examples are binding. Romans 15 and verse 4. He said to them, whatever things are written before were written for our learning, our instruction, literally our training, so that we, through the patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. But there's still going to be a whole bunch of people that claim that these can't be a binding on us. They'll say, that's just how Paul did it. That's just how Peter did it. It doesn't mean that we have to do it that way. Notice with me, Ephesians 5, 1 and 2, first of all. The greatest example of all, our Lord Christ himself, were commanded not just to obey him, but to literally try to live as close to how he lived as we can. Ephesians 5, 1 and 2, be imitators of God as beloved children. And how do we do that? Walk in love as Christ also loved us and gave himself as a sacrifice and offering to God for a sweet smelling aroma. You see, we're directly commanded to follow an example. We already studied how direct commands are always binding, so he's saying follow an example is commanded. They are authoritative. But not just the Lord's example. 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, Paul said, imitate me even as I also imitate Christ. In one sentence he said, imitate him most of all, but imitate me as I do that too. Or Philippians 3.17, he said, not just me, but any mature Christian you can imitate. He said there, Philippians 3.17, specifically join, brethren, and following my example. And also note those who so walk, because you have us for a pattern. In other words, any spiritual, in the context, any spiritually mature Christian, if they are truly obeying God, we can imitate them and learn from them how to serve Him. And if you really want the, you know, the final word on examples, turn just one chapter over to Philippians 4 and verse 9. Because here in one sentence, Paul says that his teachings and his examples were equal in authority. Notice there, he said to them, the things that you have learned and received, skip that for a minute, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. So, before we look at those two words I skipped, 
What does he mean, the things you learned and received from me? Obviously, the will of God. He went around teaching the gospel all the time. So how did he teach it? Notice that. The things you learned and received. How? The things you heard and saw in me, these do. Not just the words, but his actions. His example. His example was just as binding as his public preaching. That's what we have to understand from this. And so how do the examples fit in with the commands? For example, the procedure for the Lord's Supper is given in, by Jesus in the night when he, which he was betrayed. Matthew 26, 26-29 and other passages. Paul repeats it in 1 Corinthians 11. And he even adds in 1 Corinthians 11 that there is a, a special time that people gather together to observe the Lord's Supper. But he didn't say when. In fact, it's left in, until the, uh, Acts 20 and verse 7. An example is the only time it tells us when we are to meet together. He said there was a set time in 1 Corinthians 11, but we don't find out until Acts 20 and verse 7, where it says that it was upon the first days of the week when the disciples would gather together, literally assemble for worship. The same word for congregation there. They would assemble for worship. And then they took the bread together, which is the Lord's Supper. They, Paul preached them until midnight even though he was in a hurry to leave. Same thing with the elders. We have a bunch of places where it refers to the qualifications of elders. 1 Timothy 3, Titus 1, 1 Peter 5, Acts chapter 20, and other places too. And all of those qualifications are absolutely required before a man can be appointed an elder. People will call other people elders, or pastors, or bishops, but they're not if they're not qualified by God's word like that. But you know, the only time it tells us for sure that there must be more than one per church is when it's talking about an example. There are several examples, but it never comes right out and says you must only have multiple elders per church. But in Acts 14.23 and many other passages, whenever it mentions elders, they're always plural. If the Bible always did in plural, we need to do in plural here. In Acts 14.23, the first elders in the new churches on the first missionary trip, what does it say? They went back through and they appointed elders, plural, in every church. If Paul had to do that, then surely we have to do that too. And there's also what I call bad examples or disapproved examples. They're just like commands and implications. There's positive ones and there's negative ones. The young brother read them for us this morning. 1 Corinthians 10, 6 through 12. He started off by saying these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after the evil that they also lusted after. He's talking about the Jews, or rather Israelites, following Moses in the Old Testament, in the wilderness wanderings. And he read it detail for detail, so we don't have to read it. But notice verse 7, they were worshiping idols. Notice verse 8, they committed sexual morality. Notice verse 9, they tried to test God and say, give us these things if you really want us to serve you. Verse 10, they complained and they murmured against him. And so, verse 11 comes around and he says, all these things happened to them as examples. And they were recorded for what? For our admonition. Literally, our warning and instruction upon whom the last ages come. Therefore, let him who thinks he is standing take heed lest he fall. In other words, and I mean, I mean, this is very important to understand. If we do not understand this, we're going to miss it. Their examples were binding, but they were negative examples. Don't do these things. Make sure you do them do the other things, not these things. And he said that as a command. So we could go on. There are literally hundreds of more examples of each of these three things, of commands, of examples, and of implications. But these should be enough for the honest heart to understand that God's word can only be interpreted in these ways. If we don't understand that, then we're going to miss what he means. And if we teach something that is not authorized in one of these three ways, we're going to be guilty of what's given in Romans 16, 17, when he said to mark and avoid those who teach things that are contrary to the doctrine which you have received. These are the only ways in which the Bible authorizes us to do things. Now, there are other things related to these matters of authority that we will discuss tonight. And when we do so, hopefully, we will understand how they're related too, because not everything is as cut and dried as command, example, or implication. And so we need to learn more tonight. But for now, if we have something in our life that is not where it should be, if we are struggling with so many things that we don't 
follow his word in our life, whether it's because we misunderstood these commands, examples, and inferences, or whether it's because we're just not dedicated as we should be. Ultimately, it boils down to this. If we want to have him be happy with us, if we want to receive his blessings in our lives, then this is the only thing we can do, is to obey his will. He said in John fourteen fifteen, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. It doesn't get much plainer than that. Do we love him? Do we want to serve him? Do we want to do the things that he wants us to do? Or do we want to do it our way? Because if we do it our way, that's when we're going to fall. The day if we've done religion our way in the past and we want to make sure that we're right with him now, it's very simple. Come to him in simple belief and humility. Trust in him that he means what he says. Obey him by repenting and making the decision to turn away from sin and enact that obedience by being baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission or removal of your sins like it commands for all people in Acts 2.38. And then you'll have those sins removed. You will be forgiven and you will be saved. If you don't do that, you will be lost. There is no other pattern by the pattern he has recorded in his word. If we try to do it our own way, we're also going to be lost. Or perhaps today you did that, but you've wandered off the path. It's easy. We said last week the path to the truth is difficult, and it's fraught with many traps and many perils. And so today, if that has happened, and you want to get right with him again, and you desire the prayers of the church to help you do that, we can do this as together we stand and sing the invitations.